started here, guys. So, uh, first of all, thank you for having us uh, come present to you folks. Um, with a uh, light crowd in the room, I think we'll have a chance to make it as interactive as you wish to make it, so uh, feel free to stop me along the way. Um, I guess, first of all, in the, uh, in the guide that they published out, uh, it was advertised that Scale Computing's Chief Technology Officer, Jason Collier, would be here doing the presentation. He was here back at the spring event. Um, he got called away on a different project uh, this week and was unavailable to travel here, so I am filling in in his place. Uh, my name is Kevin Greenwood. I'm the uh, Global Director of Channels at Scale Computing, and I live here in North Carolina. So uh, always enjoy coming to present at Nickel Jesus. I'm going to ask how many people are familiar with scale, but I'm looking out and I'm seeing some uh, fairly familiar faces, and so that's that's encouraging. Um, I'll uh, I'll take you through some some overviews of scale um, and the, the sort of the market conditions that that we work to address, and like I said, uh, make it as interactive as you wish. Um, we'll do what we can to, to answer questions directly along the way. Um, first of all. I'm, Am I talking loud enough for everybody to hear? Okay, great. Um, so this slide is probably one that uh, resonates with, with most folks. It certainly does you know, in, in my world as well, too. Um, you know, it seems like the number of hours you have in a day and the amount of responsibilities you have to accomplish uh, are, are not quite congruent with each other. And, and certainly in the world of IT and IT management, uh, that is certainly the case. Uh, more responsibility. Uh, constrained time to get it accomplished, and certainly, uh, if not decreasing budgets, certainly what we see a lot of is flat budgets. Um, so you've got the same amount of money to work with, but a lot more responsibility to, uh, to manage. Um, I've been in a lot of data centers over the last 20 years. Um, I would guess somewhere on the order of 5,000 different data centers in, in 20 years of time. Uh, that picture that you're seeing there is shockingly prevalent. <laughs> That's not always the case, but it is shockingly uh, prevalent in uh, the data centers that I've been into. Um, in the small to mid-sized market data centers, uh, this is actually quite common. So, um, you know, I'm sure all of you guys have pristine, wonderfully arranged data centers, and we won't say anything about that, but uh, uh, the question I, I like to throw up at uh, when we're talking about kind of a data center refresh anyway is think about the number of vendors that are that, that make up your data center. So if you look at a traditional data center infrastructure, uh, I'm sure you've got a vendor who's providing the uh, host server hardware. If you are using virtualization, you've got a separate vendor for virtualization software. Uh, if you have invested in shared storage like a SAN or a NAS, that's oftentimes a third vendor. Uh, if you are doing some sort of uh, backup for recovery purposes, that may be vendor number five. If you're doing uh, replication for the capability of failing over to your DR facility and failing back, often that is not the same vendor, so that might be vendor number six. Uh, we haven't even gotten down to the switching layer at that point or the fabric layer to uh, handle the networking in between all of that. So now you're at vendor seven. Um, maybe you've got virtualization in place and you're utilizing some sort of a external management tool. Um, see a lot of folks using solar vent or, or tools like that, right? And so now you're adding up vendor eight. And, you know, as you start to look through this, you see a, uh, just a, a wild quantity of different vendors, different products into that mix. Even where we find clients who have worked hard to reduce the complexity of their data center infrastructure. You know, maybe they're trying to standardize all HP hardware. So they've got HP host servers, they've got HP SAN, they've got HP Pro Curve switching. So yes, they've consolidated the vendors that they're using, but the administrative interface for that Pro Curve switch is completely different from the administrative interface for that SAN. Uh, you're talking different skill sets, different individuals who tend to manage that, uh, certainly different logons, and, and of course, you're looking at a different support contract. Uh, so you're paying for support on one, you're paying for support on another, etc. So you know, as, you, as you look through that, um, it gets 
what. So the slide I'm showing now is representative of a traditional data center infrastructure for a small organization. Uh, by the way, when, I, when I, I'll say small organization, SMB, mid-sized company, what I'm really referring to there uh, from the perspective of scale computing is a company who's got probably at a minimum somewhere between seven to maybe 10 servers. Uh, if they're any smaller than that, they're, they're probably not investing in you know, data center infrastructure. They're buying a server here or there. So at a minimum, we'll say roughly 10 servers. On a high side, uh, maybe 200. Uh, our sweet spot is probably customers who are running somewhere between 15 and 150. But uh, we, we handle environments of you know, somewhere between 10 and 200 servers. Uh, virtual desktops can come into play in that as well too. And of course, that's going to add a quantity to that. Um, you know, that can vary wildly, right? So we've got some K through 12 school systems who have 2,000 or 3,000 virtual desktops, but uh, they still only have, you know, extraneous to their PC tax, they've got three or four IT people total. So uh, Scale Computing is a vendor focused exclusively on small to mid-sized organizations out there. Um, usually, some are between one and usually no more than five IT professionals in the organization. Um, in that scenario, you know, everybody is uh, wearing a lot of hats. Um, everybody's stretched in, everybody's, uh, you know, uh, doing multiple jobs, it seems, and they don't have the luxury of having an entire department within IT who's focused on uh, server infrastructure or a separate department that handles virtualization or a separate department that handles shared storage, etc. So everybody sort of wears all hats and they've got to be uh, proficient at that. That can be challenging when you've got a slide, you know, a scenario like we looked at back, oops, back uh, here. Um, you know, if you've got seven or eight or ten different vendors in there, you know, you're probably involved with sending somebody to training classes. So if you're a small organization, you've got three or four IT people in there, you know, you're taking somebody out of the field for a week to go to training, maybe some other person comes out of the office for a week to go to a different vendor's training. There's just not enough time in the, in the work space. There's not enough money in the budget to send everybody to all the trainings that they need to accomplish. And what we generally find there is uh, a lot of people are tasked with stuff that they're not quite ready to deal with. So, um, so what I'm showing here is the data center infrastructure for a typical mid-size or, or small organization. You know, they may have 25 servers, we'll call it, in that environment. So they, in this example here, they've got uh, three of those servers. They're uh, cross-connected back through uh, redundant switch paths to shared storage devices, and uh, they've got either VMware or Hyper-V or something to that effect in there for virtualization. It's, a, it's an architecture that we're familiar with. It's very proven. It's been around for a long time. Uh, I can't argue with the effectiveness of this architecture, but you know, clearly, as we talked about a moment ago, with six or seven or eight or ten vendors in that, there's some complexity to that, and that complexity comes with the cost. Uh, both a, uh, a real cost in terms of dollars and a cost in terms of time and, and uh, energy expense. So, uh, if we if we really step back from you know the, looking at it from a vendor perspective and and even just that perspective there and, and think about well why do we build that architecture in the beginning? Um, the simple answer to it is we're trying to eliminate single points of failure in our data center so that the applications the business depends on are always available to the users who need them, right? So how do I achieve high availability? Well, I have redundancy in my systems. So in this example here, I've got three different host servers. One of those host servers could fail, the surviving two could keep everything up and running. That's only possible if I build in high availability, right? So the, uh, and I'll step back here. The, uh, the host server by itself, highly available or not? Nope. Uh, virtualization software. By itself, highly available or not? Nope. Sand storage, by itself, highly available? Nope. So the only way you've got high availability here is you had to add you know, this piece plus that piece plus this piece plus this piece to, to build in high availability to your architecture. Scale Computing took a look at that and said, for a small organization with one to five IT professionals, limited budgets, limited expertise, uh, limited time dedicated to gaining technical expertise, uh, 
yet still needing to achieve high availability and as close to five miles as possible for their infrastructure, there's got to be a better way. Um, Hyperconvergence was just starting to take off, and so what we put together was an architecture that uh, is not, I don't know if you're familiar with BSAs, uh, virtual storage appliances, that's how a lot of the uh, other bidders out there are accomplishing hyperconvergence. It's a, it's a virtualization of storage as a VM with a master VM connecting down to all of your application VMs. Uh, so what we determined was that applications uh, or virtual machines really want to talk directly to block storage. Um, they, they don't like talking to file systems, they don't like going up and down the stack to communicate. Uh, they like the efficiency of talking directly to block storage. So, what we wrote was a high performance computing uh, clustered architecture built around Linux. And the other big frustration with virtualization has always been, for the, the mid market anyway, um, you know, the VMware approach of, well, I've got six different license levels. Which features would you like? You know, if you're willing to spend X amount of money, you'll get these features. If you are willing to spend 2X that amount of money, you'll get those features. If you're willing to spend 3x that amount of money, well, you get these features over here. Um, that has been so common as a vendor approach to dealing with the mid-market that scale computing felt like they could turn that almost on its head. Um, rather than saying you only get you know, the license level or the feature level uh, that comes with the, you know, the license level you bought, uh, our approach was Every customer cares about backup. Every customer cares about disaster recovery. Every customer cares about high availability. Every customer cares about you know, the, the, the efficiency and ease of use, et cetera. So let's build this thing so that there are no licensing restrictions at all. All customers get all features. And let's make this thing as simple and easy to use as possible. So what we came up with was this scale HC3 uh, configuration. It's basically a data center of box, if you will. Um, it's delivered, as you saw on the previous <coughs> slide there, it's delivered as a, uh, uh, a collection of at least of three 1U rack mount nodes. Uh, so they look just like a server, but uh, as we install them, there's a, a system in there that's, that's basically federating these three independent nodes into one data center. So we, we call it almost a data center in a box. It functions as your virtualization software, your host server hardware, and your shared storage, all as one solution. Uh, specifically built for uh, a small to mid-sized organization to deliver the, uh, the effective simplicity of managing a single server. So you've got one pane of glass to administer your entire data center infrastructure. Um, imagine you're running one of the, the, the you know, rat's nest we saw there of a data center before, and it's time now, uh, it's patch Tuesday, you've got some updates for, for Microsoft in your environment. You've had uh, some backlog on updating some of your other firmwares out there. Um, you know, what's your plan then to, to get firmwares updated in your environment? You know, do, you, do you schedule a maintenance window and bring everything down and spend a lot of time doing it all? Or uh, you know, how do you deal with that type of situation, especially where you've got you know, at a minimum, probably three different vendors' products in place. Um, we took a look at that and said, wow, that, that's a challenge for a small to mid-sized organization. Uh, it's a challenge that we know we can help address. So with that single pane of glass administration, there's one button to click that updates the entire infrastructure. You can also imagine that if you've got vendor A plus vendor B plus vendor C, that vendor is primarily responsible for supporting their product. However, what you have deployed is not just their product. You've got their product hinging on two other vendors' products. So the interoperability between those vendors really falls to your shoulders. You know, yes, those vendors will provide some assistance, but again, their primary goal is to support their piece of the puzzle, not the whole architecture that you have built. So the scale computing architecture, on the other hand, all being integrated together, we support the entire infrastructure, the whole stack. So one button to click, one phone, talk, phone call to make. If you're having a bad day, something's not going the way you expected, you know, you could say it's one throat to choke. Nice and simple. Uh, if you are having a good day, hopefully it's one back to pat. That's, that's our hope and our, our vision for the company. Um, but uh, that's the concept there. 
So one pane of glass to do all the administration. That administration, by the way, a firmware update that I was giving you an example of, that is a non-disruptive process. So you know you can do that in the middle of the day on a Tuesday without having any impact on your users' access to their applications, their data, etc. Uh, automatic high availability. So there's no possible way to create a VM, store a block of data, do anything that is not automatically highly available in this architecture. So there's no concept of having to do it right to build it in, it's already there. Uh, and finally, it is that modular architecture. Uh, we do start with a minimum of three nodes. With three, that's your highly available M plus one architecture. We can lose one of the three, the surviving two, keep everything up and running. But if you start with three, or you can start with four or five, um, to grow or expand, you just add one node at a time. So if you started with three, add node, node number four, and uh, you gain the resources uh, of that fourth node added into your system. Uh, we do offer some differences between nodes, and I'll get into this in a moment, but it is possible to expand separately things like compute versus memory versus storage. So there's a lot of flexibility built into it, even though it's a, 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 an appliance-based architecture, there is a lot of flexibility built in there. All right, so I've been talking for a few minutes. Let me pause there. Any major questions? Anybody disagree? Anybody want to make a comment on that? Jump right into the next step here. So, all right. So, a um, little bit about the company itself. So, we're uh, about seven and a half years old. I've been with the company for six and a half years. Uh, we are a U.S.-based company. We started off in Silicon Valley, California. Relocated the corporate headquarters to Indianapolis, Indiana. Um, those of you who are local to this area, I'm sure you can recall some of the, the press that you've heard in the news uh, over the last year or two about our own state government here in North Carolina trying to decide what's the appropriate path to take to, uh, to provide incentives to corporations who either are looking at relocating to North Carolina or expanding here in North Carolina. Um, Indiana, much like every other state out there, was doing the same thing. We had to catch it at the right time, and they lured us from California to Indiana, uh, paid us a whole bunch of money, gave us you know, very great incentives to relocate there, and so we did. Um, that took place five and a half years ago, I guess. Um, so we've been growing uh, ever since from there. The picture you see on the screen is our corporate headquarter office in uh, Indianapolis, Indiana. Um, I point that out mainly because most folks I've talked to have had some experience calling tech support for a technology vendor's product. And more often than not, when you call that tech support phone number, you are not routed to someone down the street from were routed in many cases to someone on the other side of the world. Uh, someone whose primary language may not match your primary language. So not that there's anything wrong with that necessarily, but it is without a doubt a challenge to communicate. Uh, and so we have determined that one of the things we believe we can do uh, and, and give a better experience to our customers is to tell them that uh, if you are a customer in the United States or Canada, tech support comes only from the U.S. So we don't outsource, we don't offshore tech support. Uh, we do have facilities over in the U.K. We're expanding there. Uh, they are designed to support our European operations, so that's different. But if you're a customer in the U.S., that facility in Indianapolis, Indiana, provides 24-hour coverage seven days a week to all of our customers for tech support. So you're going to get someone with a very flat Midwestern accent who no doubt you can understand communicate with very easily. Um, certainly, you know, everybody likes to toot their horn. Uh, vendors like to toot their horn about uh, which, you know, who, what great customer names they have. Uh, I'm sure you can recognize a few names on this screen here. Uh, keep in mind, I did talk about the fact that our uh, primary customer base is a small to mid-sized organization. Uh, surprisingly, some of these organizations are small to mid-sized. So you see a professional NBA basketball team on there. Um, shockingly, they have well under 100 servers, actually well under 50 servers. Um, but that's the size of that organization. Um, you, you do some, see some names in there like Hilton Hotels, and yes, we do have, as a customer, a sliver of Hilton Hotels. Um, it's a management company who's uh, contracted their flag to be Hilton, and they own, I think, 10 or 15 different hotel properties. So uh, that, is, that is part of our customer base. Then you see ones like uh, Vitamix or Collaborate or wherever. Um, 
again, well under 100 servers. Uh, these are more recognizable names here. Uh, the names you see here are ones that are perhaps less recognizable unless you're local to them or part of their industry. Um, and there's one in the lower left-hand corner that you might recognize, and um, that gentleman is actually sitting in the room with us today. So uh, say hello to Scott Clark, who is uh, CIO now. Yeah, IT director. IT director, sorry. Um, giving you promotion there. Okay. <laughs> IT director for uh, Town of Fuquay Marina. Town of Fuquay Marina uh, became a scale HC3 customer several months ago. Um, they've been going through the process of migrating their workloads over to the scale cluster. Um, I think for the most part that's gone well. They've had some, some challenges uh, with a few applications here and there, but uh, feel free to talk to Scott at, at your leisure uh, about his own experience with that, and uh, I'm sure you can get some details there. But uh, again, most of our customers are small to mid size. Uh, having said that, uh, we certainly do have a range of customer performance demands, customer capacity needs, etc. And so we have different models to help address those needs. Um, the model in the lower left hand corner there is called our HC1000, that's our entry level model. Um, it is very entry level. Um, it's priced aggressively, very low. Um, it's not going to be high performance. It's not going to you know, be the rocket ship of the, uh, of the stable there. Um, but you know, it can be a great fit for a small organization. It could be a great fit for being the DR for a larger organization. Um, by far, our most popular model is the middle tier, the HC2000. Um, I'd say well over half of our customers are, are, are uh, using that product line. Um, we launched the HC4100 about a year and a half ago, I believe. Um, so that one has begun to become uh, a lot more popular. Uh, certainly opened up the door to us working with a few larger customers as well. But uh, you, know, you can see there, the capability exists to grow that environment all the way up to as many as 400 VMs. Uh, that's absolutely true, but again, the bulk of our customer base sits somewhere between 15 and probably 150, 175 or so. All right, so we talked about the fact that a minimum starting config of a cluster is three nodes. I'd like to show you now what MSRP looks like for that config. So the numbers you see there are real, true, honest numbers. Uh, if you wrote a check for that amount of money, you'd get that cluster. Uh, you can plug that into your network switch and start migrating your server workloads or even your desktop workloads over onto that and be off to the races. There's nothing extraneous to that that you have to buy. There's no extra licensing to that. There's no other hardware required. That is absolutely everything. Uh, that's pre-populated with disks. That even includes first year of support. Uh, now, some things will impact the pricing you see on that. Uh, for example, uh, you may want to choose to go ahead and cover support for years two, three, four, five, et cetera, right? That's going to uh, impact the price of that. The prices you do see on there reflect the smallest capacity hard drives for each of the models that are shown. Uh, we do offer larger capacity drives, and those will cost more. Uh, we offer some of the models with either gigabit or 10 gig networking. Uh, 10 gig costs a little bit more than the gigabit. Uh, some of the models are offering uh, expanded RAM options. So, you know, if, uh, for example, on that HC2000 middle tier, that one comes standard with 64 gig of RAM. Maybe that's not enough for your needs, right? So we can bump that to 128 per host. So that usually fits pretty well with an organization who's got 50 or less virtual machines that are managing. Um, larger environment might need a little bit more than that. So the HC4100, that ships with 128 gig of RAM by default, but if you need more, we can add more. Uh, you can bump that one to say 256 gig of RAM per host. Um, generally speaking, for an environment with somewhere between 100 and 150 servers, configured with three or four of those HC4100s, that easily handles that size of the environment. Questions on that? By the way, this is everything you see here is on the back page of our product brochure. Uh, we have those at our booth table, so if you want a copy of this, uh, just grab one of those brochures on your way out. Uh, we do get asked, what is the price of the individual node? Um, it is uh, terribly complex of divide three by divide a three node cluster by three, and you get the price of the individual node. Um, 
A lot of our clients are electing to pay on an operational cost versus a capital expense cost. So uh, we have programs where we offer monthly payment options that can be spread out over the course of one, two, three, four, five years, etc. However you choose to do that. Um, right now they're running a promotion on the leasing. Uh, anyone who would purchase now with a, uh, a lease arrangement, first payment's not due until January. So you have the ability to push that initial payment out to some extent uh, on some of those promotions. Um, we talked a little bit about support and the fact that it's included in the pricing for the first year. You can add or extend that later on. You can choose not to as well, and you just renew year by year if you want to do that. Um, but let's talk about support. So support for scale computing includes three components. Uh, part one is what you would expect, telephone tech support access. That is, again, 24 by 7, uh, 365 coverage. So you always have the ability to call and get a lot of individual there on the phone. Um, the other two parts, uh, so part two is firmware updates. Um, what you have seen and what I have shown so far is a hardware product, right? But the reality is that is commodity hardware. We don't do anything to customize it. We've chosen the hardware vendors that we use based on the fact that that is an easily supported hardware platform. The technology itself is really software defined. So I'm sure you've heard the terms software defined infrastructure, software defined data center. This is what that is. This is entirely software defined. All of the expertise and technology, etc., is in the software. So for us, a firmware update. Uh, could be a patch update, certainly those exist, but the reality is at least twice a year we put out major new firmware updates. Major new firmware updates equal new features. So you buy this product and you know you make your decision to invest in this product based on the feature sets that are in there today. Six months from now you get your next set of new features probably, or maybe less than six months depending on when you bought it, but you're going to get some quantity of new features that show up in the next firmware update. Six months from then, another new feature update, right? So over time, this product should get better and better, more capable, stronger, faster, etc. cetera. Um, and you know, what have you done? Well, you've renewed support or you paid for future years of support, but the reality is you're getting new features um, about twice a year. So those are, uh, those are, that's part of it. Again, all customers get all features. So that's how that works. Finally, the third part is, uh, it's uh, the hardware warranty in there as well too. So uh, if anything breaks, anything goes wrong with that hardware, uh, we're going to overnight a replacement component to you. Uh, we cover the shipping on that. It is overnight delivered on every single time. Um, you'll get that the very next morning. We're going to call you and walk you through uh, any steps that you might need to do to get that uh, put back in place, right? So I'll go through some of the high availability details in a, an upcoming slide here, but uh, I want to highlight the fact that that's part of support. Um, most of our customers come to scale computing from a VMware environment. That's, uh, that's you know, certainly the most prevalent virtualization software out there. Um, others have come from Hyper-V. I know you guys came from Zen. Um, when we talk to clients who come from VMware, you know, I think they are probably, just in a purely dollars perspective, paying the most of any other vendor out there for virtualization software. So we generally find that those folks end up saving a good amount of money um, you know, can be as much as 50% or more in uh, costs from the infrastructure that they came from to selecting and migrating to scale. So there's, uh, uh, you know, we really focus on the ease of use, the simplicity, the reduction of complexity of the architecture, but the reality is it does cost less as well too, and that does make a big difference, and we know. Um, all right, so the next couple of slides are going to give you a quick uh, view into the administrative interface. This is that single pane of glass that I was talking about before. Uh, as you see on the slide here, what you're looking at, uh, lower left hand, or lower right hand corner, uh, that's the, the, the data center view of those three nodes, but uh, the administrative view through the GUI of those three nodes are those follow those three arrows, right? So node one, node two, node three. Uh, I'm only going to move over here and point out a few things. So. Uh, this one here, that's a separate host server, that's a separate host server, etc. Um, the white lines that you see here are representing the virtual machines that are running on that host server. Uh, same here, same there. 
But down here, what we're looking at is the same virtual machines, except that instead of being grouped by which host server they're running on, down here, these are grouped by some logical group that you've defined, right? So I think this one is our Windows servers. This is our template servers. This is Ubuntu servers. However you choose to define or group those servers, that's going to show up there. Everything, again, managed through that single, uh, single interface. Um, to add a new VM, I don't know if you can see this, but there is a plus button on the, uh, on the screen there. If you would have clicked that, you get a pop-up dialog box. And uh, it's as simple as you know, following the tasks here. So you give it a name, a description. If you want to tag it into one of the groups, you can do that there. Uh, select your operating system. Uh, it'll automatically inject the correct performance drivers into that. Um, select how many uh, resources that virtual machine should be given, so how many CPU cores, um, how much memory will be assigned to that VM, uh, the size of your virtual hard drive, the quantity of virtual hard drives you wish to give it. Uh, if you want to tag separate VLANs uh, in there as well too, that's part of that. And then finally, uh, select the boot image uh, location where we'll grab that uh, ISO from and click create and that VM gets added in automatically. So again, as I mentioned before, there's no way to create a VM without it being highly available. As soon as you click that create button, that virtual machine is automatically highly available. Get the note upon which that VM is now running, uh, were you failed, those VMs were going to get restarted on surviving nodes in the cluster. I think that's actually shown here in the, uh, in the next one. Right? So, uh, in this example here, the third node, the one on the far right hand corner, has failed. You get the, uh, the notifications there that you've had a hardware failure in your environment, and those virtual machines will then be automatically restarted on surviving nodes in the cluster. That process can, can take as little as 30 seconds. I've seen it done very, very quickly with a, a fast environment. Uh, often that uh, is predicated on an, an operating system that also can boot very quickly, like Ubuntu or, or Linux or what have you. Um, so if you're booting a Windows server, that may take you know, two minutes or so uh, to do that. But uh, the, that uh, restart is incredibly fast. The uh, heads-up display that you see across the top there does keep you uh, basically informed across the entire environment. Uh, what are my resource utilization loads at the moment? Um, it's not designed to give you granular detail that you could get into an individual VM, but um, you know the, uh, the colors there are designed to change if you surpass your high availability threshold. So this one here is telling us that uh, we've got so many VMs now running on there that if one of the nodes were to fail unexpectedly. Um, there's not enough free capacity on the remaining two nodes to be able to restart all the nodes, all the virtual machines. Um, you, you'd be able to start some of them, but not all of them. So uh, you don't want to get up into the red or orange, I guess that is, uh, coloring on that heads up display. Um, so the, uh, the option would be, you know, depending on the model, you can either add additional RAM to that node or uh, you could actually add another node resource to the cluster, which I think is what's shown here. And uh, now that, that new node's resources contribute to the cluster as a whole, and uh, you're back into the safe green zone, and you can then live migrate some of your virtual machines over and load balance your environment. So, uh, nice and simple and easy. Uh, I did not point this out, but I will now, that uh, in the tiles that we're looking at down here, it's kind of hard to see on the screen, but every single one of these is a hot link. So if you need to change the configurations on one of your VMs, right? Uh, let's say you decided that I need to give it more CPU, right? So um, just click the button there and change the, uh, the quantity of CPU. Uh, you can set up your uh, snapshots, your backup, your replication to DR, um, any of the policies around that right through those hot links on there. Questions on, uh, on the administrative interface? Right. Okay. We, uh, we covered this topic already, uh, but it's 
it is worth mentioning. Um, so if you do need to perform firmware updates, you need to perform maintenance, um, anything to that effect, um, it is a non-disruptive process. So the, the concept there is, let's say you have a three node cluster, uh, we're going to evacuate the virtual machines from one of those nodes, moving them on to the other two. Bring that evacuated node down for maintenance or, or updates, uh, complete that process, bring it back up, rejoin it to the cluster, and then repeat the process from there. Move the virtual machines off of one of the other nodes, bring it down, upgrade it, etc. So all of that could take place during, legitimately could take place during work hours. Um, I know that may not be your chosen way of doing things, but it could happen that way. Um, you could choose to do that and, and not have a, uh, an outage there. Um, we do get a question about dedupe often. Um, there is not per se a, a dedupe function built into this, but there is a function built into this that dramatically reduces how much data you write from the beginning anyway, right? So let's say, for example, um, you are rolling out a SharePoint bot, and you've got four, maybe six SQL servers that you're going to be uh, pushing out as part of the SharePoint update or rollout. Um, realistically, they're probably going to look very similar to each other, and so why not uh, basically sysprep one of those as your golden image, right? And then clone that the other four or five times you need to disperse it out into the other servers. By doing it that way, using the cloning functionality, you're not rewriting all of the server OS and other configuration files, et cetera, each time you deploy a new VM. Uh, instead, what happens is we're inserting reference pointers into the file system, into the storage, indicating what's changed or where those data blocks should be referenced uh, to use it for the new VM. Uh, that is something that is really only possible to do if you are the vendor controlling the entire stack. Right, so if you look at a VMware or Hyper-V or a Zen or somebody, you know, a standalone hypervisor approach, that hypervisor has to work no matter what hardware you have underneath it, what hardware it's running on. In this environment here, we control the data storage. We know exactly where it is. Every piece of this is integrated. So we're able to use a allocate on write approach by inserting those pointers and saying, Yes, this pointer is belonging to this one, it's referenced to that VM. Even to the point of you can delete the original virtual machine that was your golden image. It's not going to have any impact on all of the clones that you created since then. What happens is the pointers simply change their identity reference. Instead of having an identity reference back to that VM, which you now deleted, it has an identity reference to a different VM. The data blocks are still there. They haven't gone anywhere. They haven't changed. Just reference pointers changed from one to the other. That's actually the same process we use for doing uh, snapshots. So uh, how many people have worked with VMware snapshots before? OK. Um, it works, right? Um, but you'll find a lot of people are using either SAN replication or third party products like me software, right? Because with VMware's replication or snapshot functionality, it's a copy on write approach, which basically means that when you take a snapshot, you take everything you had written before, you rewrite it again, bundle it all up with all the new changes that you've taken place, and there's your new snapshot, right? Except that that new snapshot is kind of dependent on the old snapshot, so if you have a series of five or six snapshots, can you really delete the original without having any impact on the child versions of that, you know, it's it's a bit of a house of cards, right? So you, you knock down the, the one at the bottom, and everything sort of gets impacted by that. Um, also, you know, VMware will absolutely tell you. Uh, we don't suggest that you keep around too many snapshots because the more you have, the more complexity you're building into that snapshot architecture, right? So, uh, scale computing again took a different approach to that. So the snapshots with, uh, within HC3 are, again, allocated on write. So uh, we do a quick quiesce of that, in, uh, of that virtual machine. We snap that, and we write a new uh, image file containing all of the delta block changes with the reference pointers back to where the original data exists. 
So when you take the initial snap, you know, it's going to copy the entire VM there, but every subsequent snap from that point forward is only capturing the delta block changes that took place since the last snap. Each one of those, however, does also make reference counts and reference pointers to the uh, configuration files, the XML, et cetera, et cetera. So you can actually grab any one of the point in time snapshots on HC3 that you have running on your, or stored on your cluster, and you can say, promote that to primary and run that, right? So I can legitimately, I can move that into a separate uh, test dev VLAN if I wanted to, or I could kill my production and revert back to a previous point in time in a matter of a couple seconds. Uh, they're all bootable. In fact, they're all exportable uh, right off the cluster. Uh, they're also uh, set up so that you can replicate those. And I'll get into that in just a second here. First of all, let's cover the export part of this. Um, so there's plenty of vendors out there who make a very good business on being able to um, take off-site backups of your environment, right? Um, and, and clearly, a lot of the uh, regulatory compliance aspects of rules out there talk about needing to have off-site backups, you need to be able to prove that you can restore from those, et cetera, unless you're doing something to the effect of real-time failover between you know, data center A, data center B located at different sites. Um, so there are tools that you know, can do the backup and recovery. There is also tools out there that get down to the individual file level. And you know, there's, there's truly value to that, but what we decided was uh, just the ability to be able to export your virtual machines and get your, your data backed up and off-site or to an off-site location is a feature that we believe should be standard. You know, everybody needs it. You know, why should you have to buy a third-party product to get that functionality? It should just be part of the product. So we made it part of the product. Um, so you can take, on a scheduled basis, the VMs you have in your environment, and you can take snapshots of those and then to export those snapshots off to some external drive, some share, uh, some location, um, you know, wherever you want to send it, basically. And those are VMs that are bootable. You can import those back into another HC3 cluster. You can import them back into your original HC3 cluster. You can load them up onto a Linux server and run them directly from there. Uh, you can convert them to a VMDK and run them anywhere you want to run them. Um, so it's truly uh, recoverable at that point in time snap that you took. Beyond that, though, and this was one of the major firmware updates we just went through, uh, we decided that not only recovery from backup, but also real-time failover is something that should be a standard feature in our product. So we knew our customer base, a lot of them were, were needing this functionality. Uh, so it's now a standard feature of the product. Uh, this was a firmware update we did back in May of this year. So uh, the caveat being, you do have to have two separate scale clusters. So as long as you have you know, more than one cluster, you can do real-time failover between different sites. It's based on the same snapshot technology. So we're taking a snap and we're sending the double block changes over to the secondary. Now, do notice the blue arrow on that is going both directions, right? So secondary site can be primary for certain workloads. And it can treat what's called the primary site as its own DR. The primary site, certainly it's primary for its workloads, and it's treating the secondary site as its DR for those workloads. So the replication and the failover can go both ways. And it can go both ways simultaneously. So uh, what's really happening there is we're, uh, we're basically seeding your production environment or whatever data center is primary for those workloads. We're seeding that onto a secondary location or a different cluster. And then you're sending, every couple of minutes, you're sending all the delta block changes over to that. So let's, let's run through an example. Let's say that my primary site here experiences some sort of a, a major outage, right? Uh, of course, the ones you hear about are the, the natural disasters, the tornadoes, the fires, the floods, whatever, right? And of course, in that example there, this gets destroyed. You've got nothing here to fail back to, right? Um, and so what you're failing to at that point is your DR facility, 
and uh, that has to be primary for quite some time. The reality is that example is not as common, right? So we're not having spontaneous combustion of data centers out there very often. Instead, what happens a lot more often is uh, I'm working, you know, my data center is located in some place where there is some construction going on, or they're running new fiber or cables or electrical updates or whatever. And I have a perfectly good data center infrastructure that all of a sudden has no ability to communicate to the outside world. I've had a fiber connection cut in my environment or something has happened causing me to lose connectivity to my entire site here. All my data is fine, my servers are fine, my hardware is fine. If all my infrastructure is great, I just can't see the world. Right? So that's pretty common. Uh, we hear about that a lot. So in that example, what we would do is you're, as the administrator, um, you would be alerted to the fact that no pings are taking place at all, right? And you would want to then log in as the administrator to that secondary site and click the button to promote those replicated VMs to, pr to promote them to primary. Um, that goes through an example um, called, uh, basically you're cloning the, the last copy of the VM. That takes a couple of seconds and then you promote that to primary. So the whole process from start to finish could take under 10 minutes. Uh, if you have you know, 150 VMs, maybe that takes a little bit longer to do that. But um, right now, that process of failing over from primary to your uh, secondary site is still a manual process. So you do have to log in. You have to promote those to become primary. Uh, we're working on an update now where that's going to be scripted and done by policy. So you'll be able to choose the definitions of what that policy looks like and say, you know, if, if, uh, if my secondary site doesn't hear from my primary site after 15 minutes of pinging and, you know, nothing's going on, maybe I want to initiate an automatic failover or maybe I want to notify the administrator and say, you know, do you want a failover? Click here to, to accomplish a failover or, you know, something to that effect, right? And then, the virtual machines will be set up so that you can group those and determine which ones you want to have the most priority. So certainly there are going to be some virtual machines which have a higher priority than other virtual machines. Uh, once you identify as a uh, high priority VM, those will be started first and maybe you wait and do the updates or these, you know, you wait to start the other ones until you drive into the data center or you determine what, what has really happened over here with primary what have you. Um, so, Again, it's, today it's a manual process. We're working on making that a more automated process. Uh, stay tuned, it'll, it'll be around very soon. Um, to finish out that example though, again, most of the disasters that get declared are not that this spontaneously combusted and went away, it's that I can't communicate to the outside world here anymore, right? So now I have failed over to my DR site and this is now my production, temporarily my production environment. Everything's running here now, except I still have a perfectly viable original production environment that eventually I want to get back to. Right? Because this is probably, I probably invested more here than I did here. So this might be a faster, uh, more, uh, more capable environment than I invested in over here. So I'm going to want to get back to this. The cool thing there is, uh, you simply reverse the snapshot process. So you go back in here and say, uh, I wish to fail over those VMs over here. Uh, that failover will not take place immediately because what happens is you've got to push the delta block changes that have now taken place over the, you know, call it 12 hours that this has been running as primary, right? So you've got some changes that have taken place here. So you've got to now push those back over to that and basically bring it back up to equal standing with your, uh, with your temporary production environment here. Once that's done, it will then let you fail those over and now primary workload goes back to here and you confirm at that point then that you want to continue replicating back to this as your original DR. So production's back to this one, now I'm replicating over here. Should I have another disaster take place? It's that simple. Questions on that? Yes, sir. So, what happens if, say, you're back at the data center in another office? So, the first site goes down, 
the center office. They've lost all connection. Yeah. You fell over. Yep. These people never even knew in primary site anything happened. Right. They check them. <laughs> well, they're working away with all their information. These okay. others have been working on your backup side for the information. Uh, what happens when you connect it back to you? Good question. Um, that, is a, that is a very good question, and I don't know the answer to that one. Um, I, I will mention, I think I mentioned earlier, you know, my, my role, uh, I'm not a technical engineer. Uh, I stayed at the Holiday Inn Express last night, and I'm, I'm good to no, know. Um, I mean, that's something I ran into with, You're right. with the hyper B situation where we, yeah. we had to fill over, and we brought it back up. Right. Everything they put in for, and it wasn't that long, it was like a half an hour. Yeah. Um, you have, you would have awesome. to uh, do transaction on like some different like database. You have to have, yeah. you would have to have some fill over in your application server also. So, or you could just fill over. You could do like a you know, delta over, but that'd be a lot, uh, you know, a lot more timely, costly in time. But um, if you did the uh, had your SQL cluster, you know, set up the SQL. If you're playing an SQL uh, application, they'd have to be set up in a, a delta over situation also. Okay. So, like we have, uh, uh, we we we're, we're, we haven't set up our second site yet, but when we do, when we get the funds to do that, we're going to have just our our database servers. Um, we're going to, uh, when we do that, we'll have them export the transaction logs out to a different type of storage so we can then sync them back up if we need to. There was one other question I went out and she answered it. Okay, I, I'll try. Um, we have, I don't know if you're familiar with my time on the center, but sure. okay, anti item that comes off of our phone system. Comes in a serial port on the server. Yep. Well, I believe we had a special software just to take the antibiotic from the serial port and route it over the network so that if this box moves somewhere else or we decide to move it, right. that it can access it through the network instead of through just the serial port. Through the serial port, yep. Um, we can do the exact same thing with this as well, too. Um, there is uh, much like much like the uh, the dongle I have on the you know, the, uh, the Macintosh computer, right? So they, they make one that you plug into a switch that is basically uh, it's uh, Ethernet over uh, or dom uh, serial over IP. I guess that's what it is. Um, but we've got customers who who use that very successfully, and uh, they're they're pretty cheap. So um, those those definitely work. I'm not sure if you got my I, I would set up for Yeah, I mean, we probably should because it does come up pretty pretty regularly. Um, uh, the one that you hear, I guess, most often is, oh, I've got this fax machine that has to have the, yeah. you know, the key. How do I deal with that? Well, we can make that work. So. Uh, let's see. That's pretty much it. Anybody want to see how the, uh, you know, the high availability works kind of under the covers? I've got like three slides. That's it. So we're looking at the uh, the architecture here of HC3. Uh, I don't know how well you can see this, but this is node one here, node two, and node three in the environment. Uh, these are my VMs. I've, for the purposes of this example, I've only got two VMs running on each of my hosts. And the, I don't know what color those are, we'll call them red. Uh, these red cylinders represent a real, actual hard drive, okay? Uh, the blue cylinders represent a virtual hard drive. And what you're going to see in the animation is as the, oh, there we go, as virtual machines start to write data to the system, uh, they write data directly to a virtual hard drive, which then in turn stripes and mirrors that data across different failure groups. So every block of data that we store is stored on different failure groups. You know, the original and the mirror that way. So, um, you know, when uh, when you do have that, no doubt, uh, hard drive failure that's going to occur at some point, every block of data that exists on the hard drive that failed already exists somewhere else on a different failure group. For us, a failure group is a node, right? So, uh, when, uh, when you saw that hard drive right there fail, 
don't know if you caught it or not, but uh, it was data blocks, uh, I think it was two and eight. So those two and eight data blocks, numbers two and eight, they live here. They did live there. When this failed, the data blocks here no longer had a redundant pair, right? So they were, uh, they were a single copy only at that point. So the system detected that it had an imbalance or a non-redundant set of data blocks, and it immediately made a copy of these and put them onto a different failure group, a different node. So that all took place uh, kind of behind the scenes. So if you're familiar with sort of a traditional RAID configuration where you've got a RAID controller subbing in a hot spare, right? Uh, when you sub that hot spare in, you've got to rebuild that hot spare to look exactly like the disk that it's replacing, including the white space. So, you know, you're looking at a, uh, a potential window of double drop failure scare um, of generally hours uh, to rebuild a drive entirely. Here, we're restoring redundancy in a matter of 10 minutes. Um, could be as long as 20, but usually it's 10 minutes or less, we're res res completely restoring data redundancy. Now, having said that, you're still down, in this example here, you're down 1 12th of your capacity, right? So you've got 12 hard drives in, in this example. One has failed, you're down 1 12th of your capacity for storage. Uh, so when we overnight that replacement hard drive to you, and you put it back into the, into the system there, you don't do anything to restore. It's already been done. But you have restored your capacity, and now the system will just keep using the data that's available, right? the disk storage that's available. Now, if we extend that concept out to not just a drive failure, but also a node failure, right? So the node failure, you know, from a disk recovery or data recovery for redundancy, operates exactly the same way. The big difference there is that I've also got to factor in the restart of virtual machines on other host servers. So we'll see that node 3 fails. It's going to rebalance all the data or re-mirror the data, again, taking copies of, that are no longer redundant and making copies of them, putting them on different failure groups. That happens automatically. The other big thing is when I have a host server fail, those applications, those virtual machines running on that host server, they get orphaned. Right? They're, they're going to fail. They're going to fall down. Um, the system detects that. It knows that they should be running. So it's going to quickly restart those on surviving nodes in the cluster. And that's, again, where you, may, you do want to make sure that you don't go above what we call the HA threshold. So if you're in a three-node config, each node represents 33% of your environment, right? So that being the case, you really don't want to go beyond utilizing 67% of your infrastructure. It's there, you could use it, but if you did, you can't recover everything or, or restart all the VMs in the event that you have a failure. If you have a four node cluster, your HA threshold is not 67, but it's 75. Or a five node cluster, it's 80, right? So uh, you can do the math. But uh, you get more resilient as you increase the number of nodes. You also gain the ability to use more of your available capacity. But, uh, but that's how the system works. Can you tell what, okay, this is a server, it has to be redundant, whereas I've got maybe a print server that if something happens, it can go away. Um, currently, no, but that is one of the things that we're working on right now. Um, it goes back to that, that concept of, you know, this is a more critical server than these, and I want these to be started first, or I want these to follow the following policy as to how I'm going to deal with that. Um, I didn't mention it, but uh, and it's not really our feature, but if you're running Windows uh, as an operating system, and the application that you're running on Windows supports what they call Windows Cluster Manager, you can actually have one application split across two different virtual machines, basically mirrored to each other on different hosts. We do support that. Uh, it's not in our documentation because it's not our feature, it's a Windows feature, right? Um, but if, if you have an application that does support Windows Cluster Manager, it will run effectively on your on your scale cluster. So you could have one VM spread across, or one application spread across two VMs, each on different hosts, and that does work. 
Yeah, it, 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 uh, it can't get that 